Let's go, guys. All right. All right. Double tap on it, and then hold. Double tap and hold, and then move. No, it doesn't work. Use the, use the, oh, you don't have a mouse there? Let's add a mouse. My apologies. Boss is fine. Here we go. Oh, okay, now you can use a mouse and do your magic. Okay. So, this is a general overview of the time period we did. It's essentially the part where Napoleon lost its groove. Uh, so, it starts with Napoleon's defeat of the Fifth Coalition. Uh, after which there was a major lull in warfare for about three years. On June 23rd, 1812, hostilities resumed as Napoleon launched his invasion of Russia, hoping to defeat the last continental empire that stood in his way and also try to force them into his continental system. Uh, despite essentially winning every battle that they followed Russia as he went deeper into the country, the French were called hungry due to the scores of British policy by the Russians, and eventually they had to retreat to France with only a fraction of their army still alive. In 1813, the Sixth Coalition formed against France and Napoleon defeated them many times, culminating at the Battle of Dresden. They were eventually defeated by a massive coalition army at Leipzig, but France refused to surrender. Despite never losing a decisive battle after Leipzig, Napoleon's army was weak. His senior generals were in open mutiny and he had no choice but to surrender in 1814. Shortly afterward, he was forced to abdicate. He was then exiled to Elba in the Mediterranean, where he stayed for a while before returning to France and becoming the emperor a second time. He promised a peaceful foreign policy, but the weary European powers immediately sent a massive army to destroy him. Napoleon fought his last battle at Waterloo, Belgium, where he was decisively defeated by a British Prussian army. He was then banished to a remote island in the Atlantic called St. Helena, finally ending his reign and then Napoleon and goes for good. So in 1812, despite the advances of his generals, Napoleon massed an army of 4,500 and prepared to invade Russia. And then he used the Polish nationalism by promising to reunite Poland into a centralized state by giving them the land that Russians had annexed years earlier. Um, knowing that they could never defeat Napoleon battle, they scorched they used a scorched earth strategy and retreated further into Russia, letting Napoleon's troops dry, die of attrition. Uh -huh. And then despite capturing the Smolensk and Moscow, Russia did not surrender, and Napoleon realized that he had to turn back to escape the Russian winter. Only 40,000. 40, that line troops remained by the time Napoleon reached the river Berezina. Berezina. First time he was defeated, and it was a massive blow to the French morale. And then after the in uh, invasion, there was a lull of hostilities as the powers broke up their weakened armies and they resumed fighting in 1813. Oh, this is um, some sort of uh, this is like a graph, a famous graph of Napoleon's army in Russia. So the beige line is their advance into Russia, and then the black line is uh, their retreat. And the thickness of the line shows the amount of troops in the army. So as you can see, they had a pretty big army when they crossed the Berezina right here, and this is their army when they came back. It's a very it's a, it's a, it's a it's a common thing. You might see that 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 image elsewhere, you know, in DBQs or something like that. Yeah. Or in in a multi multi um, uh, multi choice uh, multiple choice question also you will see that kind that graph it's a, it's quite complicated to understand at first sight though so okay so you guys you, you you understand that the beige line is the amount of soldiers that he has you know look when he gets to Moscow he already has lost almost half of his troops you know things are not good for Napoleon. 
And when he gets to Moscow and he figure out that the Moscovites, what have they done with the city of Moscow? They burned it to the ground. Burned it to the ground. They sacrificed their thousand years old capital to protect their country against an invader. Is this nationalism? <laughs> well, probably the people, I don't know if the people were really into uh, burning their own houses, but it's definitely, it's definitely, you know, the Tsar who took the decisions, that's for sure. But I'm sure that, that, that some, uh, that the Russian also, you know, when they pursue the, 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 the French after that, it's with patriotism. So basically, yes, they will rise nationalism even in Russia, where Russia is an absolute monarchy. And uh, even then, you know, uh, people will be convinced that the nation is more important than themselves. And they will fight Napoleon to the end. It's really important to see the rise of nationalism here in every combat. Thank you. So the decline of Napoleon started with the Comte de Napoleon, right? Yeah. 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 Y
fight against another country because of laws imposed by this country, do you love your country more? You want to support your country more than the enemy country? So what are you causing? Nationalism. nationalism. You see, you see, nationalism is everywhere. The Peninsula War, France declared war on Portugal and Spain. So basically what Napoleon did, he said, okay, Spain, Spain is under the rule of a Bourbon. Tell me, which country originates, uh, from which country the Bourbon family originates? France. From France. It's actually the grandson of Louis XIV, who is the king of uh, Spain. And he doesn't really trust, you know, uh, Napoleon, because Napoleon actually cut the head of his grand uncle. Uh, but anyways, he, 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 he says, okay, I cannot stop Napoleon. So Napoleon asked the, the king of Spain, can I cross your country to go fight with the Portuguese? And the king of Spain has no choice but saying yes. But you know what's going to happen. When the French troops are in Spain, uh, they're they're, the, the Spanish people don't like it too much. And, uh, and because the English are entering, you know, uh, are debarking... Uh, on uh, uh, in Portugal in in the Hispanic or Iberic Peninsula, the uh, you know the French troops start to fight in Spain. They do not declare war on Spain, but the Spanish people will revolt against the the uh, the uh, the French army, which is pretty much you know occupying their land, and that will be you know if you want to compare it to something, compare it to either the war in Afghanistan for USSR or Vietnam for the American. If you want to compare it to something like that, you know, you want to cross the different uh, periods of history in your DBQ, FRQ, short answers, you can do that because that's really what it is. The French will lose 200,000 men in Spain in something like three years. That's unsustainable. And it will also be extremely harsh against the Spanish people causing huge, huge backlashes uh, and people will start, there will be a lot of terrorist attacks against the French troops, there will be burning French camps and the French will just kill randomly uh, civilians to stop this uh, situation. And you know that killing, you know, innocent civilian never makes for a good support. You know, if you kill French uh, civilians, you're in trouble, all right? Okay, um, just, just to make sure. What did, they, what did Napoleon do with the German states? Um, just before that, you know, the German states. So with the combined Prussia, so the German states, will, they let, will he let them uh, loosely united or will try to strengthen their unification? right so he wanted the german states to be together and after at the congress of vienna he will uh, the, the the european uh, nations will decide not to have a unified germany why the reason is good why don't we want a strong nation nation state right unified nation state right in the middle of europe well because we don't want another napoleon you know is it going to happen unfortunately yes almost twice the, the people in the during the congress of vienna were right if you create a strong uh, nation right in the middle of europe like that you might create another opportunity for a new napoleon it will unify italy and it will unify germany and today, in 2016, those two countries are unified. But right after Napoleon, those two countries will be de-unified, will be, you know, cut into pieces. Okay, sorry about that. Following the victory, the coalition swore to invade Paris and dispose of Napoleon. With the combined armies of Prussia, the United Kingdom, Austria, Russia, Sweden, 
and many tiny German states forced to invade mainland France, Napoleon advocated under the immense pressure of his senior generals, who were essentially like, we're not going to support you anymore if you don't advocate. Uh, so on April 11th, the French government and the Allied nations signed the Treaty of Fontainebleau, saying that Napoleon would be removed and sent to Elba to live a life in exile. He lived a pretty nice life. Um, Elba is a pretty nice island. Also, he had an annual income of 2 million francs. 400 guards to let him retain the title of emperor. Uh, he arrived May 4th in 1814 and worked to improve Elba's quality of life and standard of living and industrial complex, all the while looking for an opportunity to return home. So, do you think the condition on which Napoleon was punished for uh, I don't know, 15 years of uh, warfare were sufficient? No. Well, <laughs> They're pretty nice with him. Yeah. Giving him, you know, you can keep your uh, title of emperor. Now you're now the emperor of the El island of Elba. There was a bit of, uh, of uh, mockery there, you know. So now you're now the emperor of the island of Elba. There's a lot of political cartoons everywhere in Europe saying that the emperor of the island of Elba, you know. Mm -hmm. And while our friend is in the island of Elba, okay, you keep keep going. Sorry. Uh, so now that Napoleon was seemingly dealt with, the powers of Europe converged at the Congress of Vienna at the invitation of the Austrian diplomat. Head diplomat Metternich. 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 To lay the lasting efforts or for lasting peace in Europe. So this was called the. Okay, this Metternich guy, uh, very important until 1848. He'll probably be, he's the mastermind of the new political order, the new world order after the Congress of Vienna. From 1815 to 1848, the strong man in diplomatic uh, Europe is Metternich. Okay, Clemens von Metternich, that's, that's, that's for sure a question on the final exam. Yes. It's quite a big presentation you have there. Huh? You had a lot of things to cover. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> General Ney is very important also uh, in all, all Napoleonic campaign. He was a very fantastic general, you know? Cool yeah, cool guy for sure. Uh, so now that he was in power, Napoleon made it clear to the countries of Europe he would, pursue, he would not pursue any more violence with them, but the great powers weren't convinced. In 1815, the Seventh Coalition was formed. Hmm. Consisting of the UK, Prussia, Austria, Russia, Hanover, Nassau, Brunswick, Sweden, the Netherlands, the Ottomans, Spain, Portugal, Sardinia, and the Kingdom of Two Sicilies, Tuscany, and Switzerland. So essentially everyone. A uh, coalition capable of fielding an army of over a million men. Napoleon figured his best option was to rapidly enlist an army before they could and destroy their forces before they could assemble. He chose first to push into Belgium, where two somewhat dispersed British and Prussian armies under uh, General Wellington and General Blucher were uh, trying to assemble. If, uh, yeah. So he chose, he tried to drive a wedge in between their armies before they could um, assemble into a main battle force, which he succeeded in doing at the battles of Ligny and at Quatre Bras. Napoleon then sent his right wing under General Grouchy to helm the Prussian army while he chased Wellington's forces towards Brussels. On June 17th, Wellington stopped and turned his men to face Napoleon on a gentle incline protected by three farmhouses a mile south of the town of Waterloo. The next day, the two forces would engage in Napoleon's last battle. Okay, so I'm just going to go over the Battle of Waterloo, the 
blue forces are Napoleons, and the red forces are Wellingtons, and the gray forces are the Prussians. So having found an easily defensible position, Wellington prepared to face Napoleon. Um, essentially what he found was this slope that had a reverse slope on the other side, which allowed a lot of his men to lie down on the slope to be protected from artillery fire and also be <clears throat> pretty much invisible to the French generals. So Napoleon, his army was pretty evenly matched with Wellington's, but he had a tricky situation. He had to grab Wellington's secure position <clears throat> before the Prussians could arrive on his flank. Unlike his other battles, Napoleon laid out a strategy and then gave most of the command of the field to Michael Ney, probably because he wasn't feeling well. He tried to commit suicide earlier and mm -hmm. it didn't really work, but it left him very ill. The strategy was essentially to try and take the three farmhouses below the bridge and push into the British flag to roll up the rest of the line. First, General Durlon, Durlon. Durlon led his infantry in a mile long assault along the British line, hoping to take the farmhouses of Hougoumont and La Haye Saint. They were unable to do so despite superior numbers and can, uh, became confused and disorganized. The British heavy cavalry took this opportunity to charge down the ridge and smash into the scattered infantry. This is a famous um, part of British history, the charge of the heavy cavalry. Although, after the heavy cavalry charged into the French in infantry, they became pretty disorganized and were actually severely beaten back by the French cavalry, so it wasn't as much as a victory as the British say. Um, with the French infantry regrouping and the British middle significantly weakened, Michael Ney tried to break through the British center with a massive cavalry charge that he led himself. Uh, so yeah, as we were saying, Michael Ney is a pretty cool guy. He had five horses killed under him in the battle, so he was right up in the front, but he was never killed or injured. Um, <laughs> so, er, at, for, at first, the British used their famous infantry squares to um, beat back the French, uh, but they came back with horse artillery and infantry and managed to almost destroy the British middle. So at this point, it was looking like it was going to be a French victory, because most of the British senior generals were killed. Uh, they were so close to breaking the British center that a few of the Allied units actually began to retreat from the field or disobey orders to attack. Um, La Haye was uh, actually captured by the French. They were essentially about to win the battle. Except then the Prussians arrived on the field after uh, marching a long way. They secured the right farmhouse of Plants and Mois and stabilized the flank on Napoleon's right. At this point, Napoleon committed his last reserve, the Imperial Guard, to the British center in a desperate attempt to break the line. Uh, the Imperial Guard had never been routed before, so it was a, it was a last ditch attempt. Um, as they came over the bridge, they were surprised by over a thousand elite British infantry who had been laying down on the slopes. They stood and fired into the guard, who took massive casualties, uh, but was returned fire so fiercely they routed all the British units. But with more and more units converging on them, the guard was whittled down to a fraction of its former strength. It was finally broken by a cavalry charge after which they routed for the first time ever. This caused mass hysteria in the rest of the French army who soon began to retreat and were screaming, uh, so like the guard is retreating every man for himself. Mm -hmm. The French army essentially disintegrated after that and Napoleon fled the field to Paris and the battle was over. Um, so having been defeated at Waterloo, Napoleon was forced to retreat to Paris where he once again was pressured to abdicate he did on June 24, 1815. He was exiled to the island of St. Helena, finally ending a 20-year period of intense violence in Europe. The Bourbon King was restored, and the Congress of Vienna, which had been in progress for months already, was signed by the major powers in Europe. The aim of the Congress was to create peace treaties for the Napoleonic Wars and also balance the power of Europe among the important countries to prevent a war such scale from ever happening again. It worked very well till uh, World War I, almost mm -hmm. a century later. Mm -hmm. Under the conference of, and the ideas of liberalism sparked by the French Revolution, they were de-emphasized in the age of conservation began again in Europe. 
So just to elaborate on that, um, the Congress of Vienna is criticized a lot for more than being a peace treaty being an attempt by the powers to keep their big empires. And the, that they had before, yeah, that they you had know, before, so, before Napole Napoleon time. Mm -hmm. They also sort of use the con conference to suppress the liberalism way that built the country. Exactly. So that's right. So the Congress of Vienna is something very important here because it's an anti-liberal, you know, Congress, a conservative Congress. They want to bring back the old order. Is it going to work? Well, yeah. So yeah. Pretty much, I would say. Um, France has a second revolution later and becomes a democracy. But for um, Germany and Austria and Russia, they keep their their SARS until. Although the monarchs who controlled Russia and Austria and Germany were pretty pitiful and mm -hmm. not very useful. If I may add as well that this will be in conjunction, this period, this new European order will happen at the same time as the Industrial Revolution, where people will be seeing an increase in an increasing gap in wealth between the rich owners of businesses and factories and the proletarians or the people working in them. And the proletarian everywhere in Europe will seek for more equality all along the 19th century. They will use either socialism or liberalism as an ideology promoted, you know, to, uh, to, to increase the equality between people. So in France, you will have another uh, revolution in 1831. You have another revolution in 1848. And you will have another revolution in 1851. And finally, uh, a last kind of revolution. Oh, yeah, that's a revolution. It's actually a communist revolution in 1872. So the United the France, France no, 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 didn't only have one French revolution. There has been many French revolutions, all right? But the most important one is the 1780-89 one, because that's the first of a series. But rapidly you will see that in... Uh, uh, until 18, in 1872, France will become what, we, what they call the Third Republic. And the Third Republic will be a real democracy with universal suffrage to a certain extent. You know, they always limit their suffrage. But, you know, it'll take a hundred years, pretty much, for France to achieve the goal of the revolution of 1789. Okay? Remember that. This is really important. Okay? This is the kind of stuff you need to put in your papers. It takes a hundred years almost to achieve the real goals of the revolution. Okay? All right. So even though the Napoleonic Wars happened over 200 years ago, the impacts are still felt today. So examples are the 12 grade school system, the metric system, the effects that led to World War I, advancement of civil liberties, numerous military advancements, creation of many new civil institutions, and the effects that led to the Italian and German confederations, freedom of the Spanish colonies, the Louisiana Purchase, War of 1812. And today, Napoleon is still revered and hated by many and is considered uh, one of the most important people in our history, and one of, if not the most brilliant or greatest mind, military mind ever, and his legacy will still continue to impact our views. Just another thing. Um, I think it's his grand nephew, Napoleon the Third. Yep. His grand nephew becomes um, the leader of France again, and um, at the same time, Prussia was pretty badly humiliated by Napoleon during the wars, and so uh, a few decades later, Otto von Bismarck used that humiliation to spark nationalism in the German state. They also engineered the Franco-Prussian War, um, which they won 
which is when Napoleon's, Napoleon III was the leader of France, um, was very badly defeated in that. Um, and that led to German nationalism of the German state. Mm -hmm. And so, the unification of yeah, Germany. Yeah, unification so, of Germany, which... Exactly. So Bismarck, Bismarck will play a double game there. He wants to crush, he says, he wants to have a large German state, a powerful German state. He wants Prussia to be the leader of all the German states rather than Austria. And to do that, he says, well, the best thing is to have a common enemy, a scapegoat. So they decided to re seek revenge over the French for the humiliation of the Napoleonic era. And also they wanted to gain more land, more power to become a more powerful state than the British economically. And that's the reason why they will decide to inv and invade France in 1871. And I will talk about that a little later when we talk about the, the 19th century. But uh, Bismarck is definitely behind everything because the Kaiser and uh, Napoleon III are quite good buddies. Have you heard of the uh, 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 telegram of Elms? So that's a telegram that uh, Bismarck will intercept between uh, Wilhelm and Napoleon, and he will transform it so that uh, Napoleon believes that Wilhelm is insulting him. Actually, he's not at all. So he'll, he'll just intercept the telegram, transform it as uh, adding a few insults in it, and send it to Napoleon, and then Napoleon will be like, "Oh, what, Wilhelm? What are you? Why are you insulting me like that?" And then he declares war on Germany. And then uh, the German uh, Kaiser asked, are we ready for a war? And Bismarck said, oh, yes, we are. And they will crush the French. Yeah, with superior technology and better strategies and tactics. All right. If you wanted to go really far and say how the Napoleonic Wars could have led to World War II, the humiliation that France saw in the Franco-Prussian War led them to put very harsh treaties on Germany at the end of World War I. That's right. So this continental conflict between France and Germany starts with Napoleon, but goes way beyond. And even today, you know, we're still seeing some of that stuff, right? You ask old people what they think about uh, the old people of France and Germany, what they think about the French and German, and they don't have positive things to say about neither one of them. So this is just um, the French Empire at its height in 1812. So as you can see, Prussia and Austria and Russia gained a lot of land. France lost 